A few uh, years ago, uh, an enterprising reporter, I think for Congressional Quarterly, he was interviewing various congressmen and senators, particularly those involved in the intelligence committees and foreign affairs committees, and he was interviewing them about the war on terror. Uh, but he, he would come to a certain point in the interview when he would kind of ask a, a gotcha question, such as, is Osama bin Laden Sunni or Shia? <laughs> and you'd be surprised at how often uh, people in responsible positions came up with the wrong answer. Uh, which is why we included in your compilation of essays, in your packets, two essays by our next speaker, John Calvert, one called What Students Need to Know About Sunni Islam and What Students Need to Know About Shia Islam, the two main branches of Islam. So I commend those particular essays to you and to your students for getting down that basic understanding of the difference between the main branches of Islam. Uh, John Calvert, uh, who is a professor of history at Creighton University is also the author of a uh, relatively new book came out a year or two ago called Sayyib Qutb and the Origins of Radical Islam. Uh, Sayyib Qutb was the uh, primary theoretician of the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood in the 1950s and uh, laid out the theoretical framework which for what we now call radical Islam. And so it was a very important figure in the entire history of the last half of the 20th century going into the 21st century, as he remains particularly influential among uh, radical Islamists. Um, we've asked uh, John to speak about Shiism and the, Sh and the Islamic Republic of Iran. So please welcome John Calvert. Thank you, Alan, for that introduction. Um, I'd like to thank the Walkman Center of the Foreign Policy Research Institute, the John Heinz History Center, and the World Affairs Council of Pittsburgh um, for the invitation to be here. It's really an honor to be amongst so many um, very fine presenters, and it's great to be amongst so many fellow educators. So I'm, I'm very, very happy to be here. Um, one sort of uh, caveat um, or heads up, and that is uh, I am an Arabist by training, um, as Alan intimated. My research interest focuses on the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. Um, that being said, I have a long-standing interest in Iran, and that um, interest traces back to a trip I took to Iran in the spring of 1979. That dates me a little bit. Um, I was a student at the time. And um, I got together with a group of friends, and we traveled overland from London, England, to Kathmandu, Nepal. Uh, this was part of the hippie trail, it was, as it was then. And in any case, that journey took me through Iran, which was in the throes of revolution. Um, it was actually a good time to be in Iran. Uh, Khomeini had recently returned to the country. Um, the hostage crisis hadn't yet begun. It was kind of this golden moment, and Iranians were very, very excited about this, this future that was opening up before them. We were invited into homes. Um, we talked with many, many different people. We were welcomed wherever we went. Um, in any case, that trip sort of awakened an interest in me in, in Middle Eastern affairs, Islamic studies, and so forth. And after a few delays, I eventually made Middle East Islamic studies the focus of my graduate work. Um, I often tell my students that the Iranian Revolution of 1978-1979 is one of the pivotal moments in modern history. I think it really is fair to compare the Islamic Revolution in Iran with the French Revolution of 1789 and the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917 in terms of significance. I mean, the world quite literally has never been the same since 1979. I mean, the contemporary Islamic resurgence effectively begins with that event. Um, the Iranian Revolution shattered sort of scholarly academic paradigms. I mean, if you went to a US university in the 1960s or 1970s, in social science departments, you would have been taught something called modernization theory, you know, that is based ultimately in the work of Max Weber and, and Tanes and so forth which held that you know, the societies of Africa and Asia were modernizing on the model of the West. 
And uh, as part of that experience, you know, I mean, the, the assumption was that um, religion uh, would, would diminish as, as a factor in public life. But yeah, we had this revolution in 79 where religion definitely became part of public life. I mean, we have these groups of medieval style, style clerics who took control of a state. Well, what I'm going to talk to you today um, are about the historical and institutional foundations of Shia Islam in Iran. Um, I'm going to talk about how Sunnis and Shi'i Muslims differ. I'm going to say something about basic beliefs and institutions of Shi'i Islam and how these are manifested in the Islamic Republic. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about Iran's clerical establishment. And I think it's important that we get a handle on this information um, because an understanding of these institutions is really essential to understanding the structure and culture of the Islamic Republic of Iran today. Um, let me begin with something you probably already know, and that is the word Islam. It's an Arabic word, and it means submission. Submission to the will of God. And one who submits to this divine will is a Muslim. Now, why must people become Muslims? Why must they submit to this divine will? Because they are in need of guidance. This is the chief problematic in Islam. Christianity, the chief problematic is salvation. In Islam, it's guidance. The idea is left to their own devices. People will get into all kinds of mischief, all kinds of trouble. They don't know what, what's best for them, but God does. Now, in practical terms, this guidance is provided by the Sharia. It's a word that you're, you've all heard, and most of you, I think, have a fair idea what it entails. The Sharia is a collection of laws, regulations, and advice to tell a Muslim how to live his or her life. It's really a blueprint for righteous living. On a vertical plane, it deals with an individual's relationship with God. And on a horizontal plane, the Sharia deals with an individual's relations with others in society. So theoretically, the Sharia is all-encompassing. Now, the great sort of task of the scholars of Islam, and remember there's no priesthood in Islam, we have ulama, religious scholars, their task is to discern this divine will, to find out what God's way, what God's Sharia is. And to this end, they scrutinize the Quran, Islam's holy scripture, they look to the example of the prophet Muhammad, they use their own reasoning powers, to make analogies between things that are explicitly dealt with in the Quran and the Hadith, which document Muhammad's sunnah or custom, or something that isn't mentioned in those sources. And at least in Sunni Islam, they rely upon the consensus of the community, all in an effort to discern God's will. Now, one other point that um, I think most of you are aware of, and that is um, within Islam there are sectarian divisions, and the primary sectarian division in Islam is between Sunni Islam and Shi'i Islam. Now, um, Shi'i Muslims comprise perhaps 10% of the world's Muslim population, um, but they're found as a majority in the Islamic Republic of Iran, um, well over 80%, maybe closer to 90% of Iran's population is Shi'i. 63% um, of Iraq's population is uh, Shi'i. Um, there's 40% of the population of um, Lebanon that adheres to Shi'i Islam. Now, in terms of belief, uh, Sunnis and Shi'is have more in common than not. Um, both respect the Quran. They believe that it's the revealed word of God. 
They recognize Muhammad as God's last prophet. Through Muhammad, God communicated his final will to humankind. And both Sunnis and Shi'is follow the obligations of prayer, fasting, pilgrimage, and almsgiving. Both revere the Sharia as the revealed word of God. So both have much in common in terms of basic beliefs. Where they differ is on the question of who should have succeeded Muhammad as community leader. Now, the Sunnis believe that the Prophet Muhammad died without designating a successor. He was silent on the issue of succession. Muhammad had a son who had succeeded to adulthood. Maybe the question would have been made easier. The answer to that question would have been made easier. But the one son born to Muhammad died in infancy. So it was left to the community of Muslims at Medina to decide amongst themselves who should succeed Muhammad as community leader. Not as prophet, because of course Muhammad is the last of the prophets. But there was, some, there was, there was, there was the need for somebody to guide the community in its worldly affairs. And so what they did is that they got together and they chose from their ranks um, individuals who came to bear the title caliph. The word caliph comes from the Arabic khalifa. It means successor. And um, in Islamic history, there are three khalifal ruling houses. Um, the Rashidun, who governed from Medina between 632 and 661. Um, the Rashidun are the rightfully guided, rightly guided caliphs. These are individuals who knew Muhammad personally and were dedicated to maintaining his ways. Uh, Sunni Muslims today look back to the period of the Rashidun as a golden age. In some sense, for the Sunnis, Islamic history has been on a downhill slide ever since, hence the periodic need for revival and reform. Um, the Rashidun uh, were succeeded by the Umayyads, who governed from Damascus, an ancient city that they had taken from the Byzantines during the period of the conquests. The Umayyads represented a distinct sort of Arab hegemony you know, over the region. Um, they have a somewhat bad reputation in Islamic history as worldly figures. I mean, the Umayyad caliphs spent most of their time, if we believe the sources, um, you know, dallying with concubines, spending time in their desert hunting palaces and so forth um, at the expense of, of, of Islam. And then the Umayyads, of course, were overthrown by the Abbasids in the year 750. And it was the Abbasids who founded the city of Baghdad from which they ruled until the Abbasid Caliphate was overwhelmed by the Mongols in 1258. Um, the caliph's duties were, were simple and straightforward. Um, they tended to become more complex over time, but initially they involved uh, defending Islam from enemies, uh, spreading Islam in the world, and making sure that the principles of Islam were implemented in society. The sort of a, a division of labor, the caliphs are in charge of political affairs, religious affairs, fell into the hands of the ulama, the religious scholars. Again, these are not priests. They don't dispense sacraments. They're simply religious specialists, uh, like rabbis in the Jewish tradition, uh, pastors in the Protestant tradition. Um, some people are bakers. Others are doctors or businessmen. The ulama make it their business to learn the Quran and teach it um, in society, keep the community on the right path. Now, in contrast to the Sunnis, um, Shia Muslims believe that the Prophet Muhammad did in fact designate a successor, namely his cousin and son-in-law, Ali ibn Talib. Uh, Ali, as the slide indicates, was married to Muhammad's daughter, Fatima. And um, this designation uh, took place um, after Muhammad had completed his last uh, pilgrimage um, he was on his way back to Medina when he stopped at a place called Ghadir Qum, the Pool of Qum. And before the faithful, he held up Ali's arm and uh, declared him to be his successor.
According to the sources, Muhammad said, everyone whose patron I am also has Ali as his patron. O oh Allah, befriend every friend of Ali and be the enemy of all his enemies. Help those that aid him and abandon all who desert him. And at the same occasion, he said, I leave behind you two things, which if you cleave to them, you will never go astray. That is the book of Allah, in other words, the Quran, and my offspring, the Ahl Bayt, the family of the Prophet. Now, for the Shia, uh, Muhammad's statements, Ad Ghadir Qum, confirm his and God's trust in Ali. Uh, Muhammad's affection and support for Ali were really evident from the beginning. Ali, as I mentioned, was both Muhammad's cousin and his son in law. He was married to Muhammad's daughter, Fatima. And having no male heir, Muhammad loved Ali's sons, Hussein and Hassan. Moreover, Ali was the first male to believe in Muhammad and the divine message that he preached. So in the Shia view, uh, these distinctions uh, really sort of pointed to Ali's position as the legitimate heir to the prophet uh, Muhammad. Now at first, um, Ali was prevented from assuming the leadership of the Islamic community. Um, other companions of the Prophet, Abu Bakr, Umar, and Uthman, uh, three of the rightly guided caliphs, assumed the leadership instead. It wasn't until 656 that Ali was given a chance to become community leader. And in the Shia view, of this, of course, was a position that Ali should have held from the outset. Um, Ali's um, caliphate was challenged by uh, uh, a guy by the name of Muawi. I don't certainly want, don't want to go into the details of this first uh, civil war in Islam. Uh, suffice it to say that this civil war um, did not end decisively. Um, in fact, in the course of this conflict between Ali and this challenger, um, members of um, Ali's camp broke away. These are the Harajites, the Khawarij. Uh, they believed that Ali had sinned by sitting down with the enemy. And uh, they ended up murdering Ali in the year 661. Um, I think the important point, however, is that all of those who expressed a special loyalty or devotion to Ali uh, took the title Shi'at Ali, or the partisans, or faction of Ali. And from this phase comes the simpler name Shia. And gradually, over a period of three or four centuries, the Shia came to, be form, came to form a distinct group, uh, a distinct sect within Islam. Now, specifically, uh, Shi'i doctrine holds that not only Ali, but all of the descendants of the Prophet Muhammad through the line of Ali and Fatima were the most qualified to hold supreme political and religious authority over the Islamic community. These descendants are, in the Shia view, the legitimate religious and political, uh, religious and political authorities of the Islamic community. Now, each person in this lineage, each of these descendants of Ali and Fatima, um, would designate uh, who should succeed him. And according to the Shia, the Sunni caliphs, including the Rashidun, um, were usurpers um, uh, who took over the leadership of the Islamic community by means of force and cunning. And so in the Shia view, the authority of these Sunni ruling houses that I indicated is absolutely illegitimate. Um, the, the, the Sunni caliphs are usurpers of the rulership that rightfully belongs to these individuals in the line of Ali and Fatima. Now, the Shia call these descendants of the prophet imams. Um, generally, imam means the person who stands in the front. So it can refer to the leader of the congregational prayers, and also to one who stands at the head of the Muslim community. However, used specifically in Shiism, the imam means that the person who refers to the person who's the inheritor 
of the prophet Muhammad, inheritor of his special wisdom. Um, the Shia believe, and, and this belief came into being a couple of centuries after the death of the prophet Muhammad, these imams are infallible. They are incapable of making a mistake in interpretation. They are not prophets, but God has given them special wisdom to keep the Islamic community on track. Now, in the Shia view, the Sunni ulama, the Sunni religious scholars, simply aren't up to the task. Their judgment is fallible. They are capable of making mistakes in interpretation and thus leading the Islamic community down the wrong path. It's similar to the argument that the church put forward against the Protestant reformers in the 16th century. According to the Catholic Church, you know, if you allow ordinary Christians to read the Bible, the faith will splinter. All kinds of churches will emerge, each based on a particular interpretation. There has to be a capstone of doctrinal authority to keep Christendom intact. And this is sort of the argument of the Shi'i theologians. God, in his wisdom, provided these imams whose judgment is perfect and fallible, and their job is to keep the Islamic community uh, from going down the wrong path, keep it from, from error. Now, um, in, in, the, in the largest grouping within the Shia, um, there are 12 of these Imams. So the, the, the dominant form of Shiism in Iran and throughout the Arab Gulf is the so-called Twelver Shiism, named for the fact that there are uh, these 12 descendants of, um, in, in Muhammad's family, beginning with Ali, who's considered the first Imam, you know, designated at Ghadir Qum, he, of course, is married to Muhammad's daughter, Fatima. They had two sons, Hassan and Hussein. And there are a number of other imams until we get to um, the 12th imam, who's given the title Mahdi, for reasons I'll explain presently. Um, according to the historical record, um, Hassan was sort of uh, bought off by the Umayyads, who by this time had assumed the caliphate. They provided Hassan with a pension, and he went off kind of in the countryside and lived a, a simple life. Let me just um, refer you to uh, a couple of verses in the Quran that, um, in the Shia view, sort of justify this sort of institution of the imamate. O believers, obey God and the apostle and those who have been given authority over you. Now, for Sunnis, uh, these individuals are the caliphs and later the sultans. Uh, sultans are simply warlords, people who take power through force of arms. They don't have the same kind of religious legitimacy as did the caliphs. Uh, for Shi'i Muslims, of course, these individuals, those who have been given authority over you, um, are the imams. Now, special significance attaches to the figure of Hussein um, the third of the uh, imams. Now, the story goes that um, Hussein, who, who was living in Hejaz in the Arabian Peninsula, was invited to go up to Kufa to join some men who had supported his father Ali against the Umayyad Caliph Yazid. They were going to raise a rebellion against this usurping sort of Umayyad tyranny. And so uh, Hussein answered the call and he made his way up from Hejaz into the Mesopotamian uh, alluvium with 72 fighting men and their families. Um, they were expecting help to come from Kufa, but that help didn't come. And so Hussein and his men uh, ended up being faced with a much larger Umayyad force. And what followed is indelibly etched in the consciousness of all Shi'i Muslims. Um, we're told that Hussein and his men were subjected to an unrelenting volley of missile fire. One by one, they fell, pierced by arrows. Hussein is portrayed, you know, holding up his young son, beseeching the enemy uh, for water until he too was struck down. Uh, the bodies were mutilated, decapitated. Hussein's head was taken to the Umayyad capital of Damascus and put on display. 
Hussein's son survived the massacre to carry on the line. But why is this event important? Well, it's important because Hussein, for the Shia, and, and for many Sunnis too, is the martyr par excellence. He is the Shaheed, the prince of martyrs. He stood up for righteousness and justice against the tyranny of the usurping Umayyad caliphs. He died fighting for the ca good cause. And um, consequently, his uh, sacrifice, his martyrdom at um, Karbala, this is where it took place in Iraq, is uh, commemorated by Shia Muslims uh, every year um, during the 10th of Muharram and, and surrounding days. This is, you know, the uh, Islam, of course, has a lunar calendar. Uh, each month in this lunar calendar differs from our solar calendar by a day or two. So these lunar months rotate through the seasons. And the first of these months is Muharram. And on the 10th of that month, you know, Hussein and his fighting men were, were martyred. Uh, they were killed in, in, in the Christian reckoning, uh, 680. Um, this um, event is commemorated uh, by passion plays. You have sets of actors who portray, you know, the Umayyads, others who portray Hussein and his companions. Um, everyone knows the story, the outcome, and so forth. It's like Christians watching a Christmas carol, you know, on Christmas Eve, you know, Scrooge and so forth. We all know the story, but it's part of, you know, the, the, the celebration. Um, everyone watching, you know, this passion play knows the outcome, but it has a sort of a cosmic, timeless significance. And uh, Shia Muslims uh, often sort of read contemporary events into this passion play, um, whereby you know, the Umayyads represent contemporary forces of unrighteousness and tyranny, and Hussein and his fighting men represent forces of justice. Um, so you know, quite obviously, this passion play took on sort of you know, special significance uh, during the years of the Iranian Revolution. You know, the, the Umayyad caliph was the Shah, and you know, Hussein was, was Khomeini, you know, this timeless struggle between good and, and evil. There's a lot of emotionalism um, in, in Shia Islam. Um, many of the imams, uh, these 12 imams, came to bad ends. Um, some were just sort of, you know, imprisoned and they led lives of quiet scholarship. Um, others were imprisoned and, and killed. Um, but there's a sense in Shia Islam that the world would have been a happier place, a better place, had these imams been given the opportunity to rule. As it was, their authority was usurped by these Sunni caliphs. You know, we live in a veil of tears. Bad things happen to good people. It would have been otherwise had justice and righteousness been allowed to rule. I remember I was in a, a shrine in Iran, um, a shrine of one of the members of an imam's family. This was in Isfahan. And um, I'm not sure if as a non-Muslim I was allowed to go there, but I was respectful and I sat in a corner and there was this wonderful mirrored ceiling and there was this you know, cenotaph in the center of the structure surrounded by this gilded cage and a steady stream of pilgrims came in you know, from the countryside um, to pay homage to this, to this saint. And this was a place where heaven touched earth. It was, a, it was a generator of holiness. And these people would circumambulate, you know, this, this cenotaph. And they would, you know, rub their hands on this gilded cage that surrounded it. And, and they would rub the baraka, the blessing from it, onto their faces or onto the heads of their children and so forth. Write down little prayers and toss it to the tomb, hoping that the spirit of this holy person would take their prayers to God. And I remember at the corner, there was this uh, old woman, you know, in her late 70s, 80s, black shador, and she was weeping uh, inconsolably. And I got the sense that she was weeping, um, you know, for the troubles of her own life. Perhaps she had lost children. I mean, who knows what sort of hardships this woman has endured, this peasant woman, you know, in her life. But I got the sense also that she was weeping for the sadness of the world, you know, the sense that, that bad things do happen to good people. There's the, the, this, this, this sense of, of sort of sadness and, and lamentation is, is pervasive in Shia Islam. 
uh, the sense that the good guys have, you know, were, have lost out, at least for the time being. Now, there is, you know, sort of, you know, hope in the horizon for the Shia Muslims. Um, there's a line of 12 imams. The Shia believed that the 12th imam, who was a young boy, um, name was Abul Qasim Muhammad. He was being held as a prisoner in Samarra. And uh, he disappeared into a well and was never seen again. And the Shia believed that he was taken up by God. He entered another dimension. He didn't die. He was simply obscured by God. He went into a state of hiding or occultation. Now, at first, he continued to communicate to the Shia Muslims through four agents. But after a while, he gave up even that form of communication. And since the year 941, the world has been in the state of the greater occultation. There was a limited occultation between 872 and 941 when he was in communication, spoke to the world through these agents, but that communication dried up in 941. And we continue this, 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 to this moment to live in this period of the greater occultation. Now, you know, Shia Muslims believe that the 12th Imam will appear to members of the faithful in dreams. Sometimes people will have waking visions of him. Uh, by and large, he is um, uh, away from us. Um, he will return, uh, though. Um, he could uh, come back tomorrow, uh, maybe a thousand years from now, um, but surely he will. And when he does, he will usher in a golden age of peace and justice, you know, the lion will lie down with the lamb. This just before the end of the world. And um, it's often said that Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, you know, believes not only that the Islamic Republic of Iran is the agency of the hidden imam, but the hidden imam's return is, is nigh, that it's, it's, it's going to uh, take place any time now. And you know, one of the traditions is that the imam will return um, when Islam is in a degraded state. And certainly there are many Shia Muslims, both in Iran and outside of Iran, who believe that the faith is in just such a condition. I mean, you have a situation where the you know, shrines, the holy shrine cities of, of Shia Islam are occupied by infidels, you know, American troops, and they're in, in, in Iraq. Um, the hordes of Gog and Magog are descending upon the lands of Islam and so forth. And this is a sign that Imam Mahdi, the guided one, is, is about to return. Um, you know, all of this is, is sacred history for the Shia Muslims, and it, it plays a major role in the articulation of politics. So, you know, getting back to, you know, um, Hussein's martyrdom, um, there was a uh, thinker, and, and you'll probably hear about him tomorrow, called Ali Shariati, who was writing in the 1960s and 1970s. And uh, he was a layman, he wasn't a cleric. Um, but he spent um, his formative years in Paris, his student years in Paris, where he imbibed the ideas of Franz Fanon um, and, and Jean-Paul Sartre and so forth. And what he did upon returning to Iran is to marry this kind of third worldist, leftist literature with symbols culled from the Shi'i heritage, uh, in particular the symbol of Hussein. And he married these two sources to create what we might call um, in Islamic liberation theology. And he began to tell young Iranian students in particular, this in the late 60s, early 70s, that they must follow the example of Imam Hussein and stand up to uh, injustice, the injustice of their own time, just as Imam Hussein did in his time. And of course, that in injustice in the 1960s and 70s was, was you know, represented by the Shah, the Pahlavi uh, monarch. Um, Ali Shariati used to say that, you know, every day is Ashura, the 10th of Moharram, every place is Karbala, you know, the struggle for justice, you know, continues. So there's this idea that um, 
these symbols can be mobilized for political purposes. Um, one interesting thing about Ali Shariati too, and, and, and other thinkers of the 1960s and 70s, um, again, these are people who were fairly cosmopolitan in the way of the world. Um, their reading extended way beyond you know, uh, the traditional sort of religious sources uh, that the scholars worked with. And they said that, listen, you know, the 12th Imam is not sort of a, a man with a beard who's going to descend from heaven. You know? That's not how it's going to happen. Uh, the 12th Imam is actually the spirit of revolution that is now sort of you know, impregnating the masses, so to speak. It's a spirit. It's, it's not sort of a, a ghost or a human being. Now, uh, the big question is, in the absence of the imam, how to discern God's will? I mean, remember, these imams were the legitimate religio-political leaders of the Islamic community in the Shia view, even though they never had an opportunity to rule, with the exception of Ali. So who is going to guide the community in their absence? Well, the short answer is the Shia ulama, the Shia religious scholars. Um, they represent the hidden imam in his absence. Um, as the imams did, um, while they were alive, they interpret the Sharia for the people, uh, they apply it, uh, declare jihad, collect religious taxes, and lead the Friday prayer. Now, there's a, a hierarchy of scholars in Shia Islam, um, much more so than is the case in Sunni Islam. Um, you have you know, simple mullahs, uh, village clerics, essentially, some of whom may be barely literate. And then at the top, you have the mujtahids, uh, those who practice independent uh, reasoning, uh, figures of, of, of high sort of medieval learning. Um, the idea is that every Shia Muslim has to follow the teachings, the guidance of a living mujtahid, a living top-ranked scholar. Um, the power of these mujtahids is based on three sources. Uh, first of all, knowledge of the sacred text. They have to know the Quran the works of jurisprudence, theology, and so forth. They have to be learned, and as I'll explain presently, it might take 20, 25 years uh, to become a mujtahid. Um, then there's a monopoly of education through the madrasa, and then these mujtahids also control sort of religious taxes. In fact, um, the, 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 the mujtahids first came to prominence in the 19th century due, during the Qajar period uh, for three basic reasons. Uh, number one, in the early 1800s, it was determined that, again, every Muslim should follow the teachings of a living mujtahid. That doctrine hadn't been sort of in place until then, not in any firm way in any case. And second, uh, most of the important shrine towns were outside of the Qajar realm in Ottoman Mesopotamia, places like Kufa, Najaf, and so forth. So that meant that these mujtahids could, um, could direct their affairs without the interference, uh, without interference from the Iranian Persian political center. And third, um, it, it's a cardinal point of, of law in Shia Islam that um, the scholars should receive taxes from the faithful. And traditionally, the people of the bazaar, as Professor Kazemi has just told us, were uh, the, the chief sort of um, uh, agents in, in, this, in this regard. Um, as I said, um, the status of a mujtahid is, is, is to become a mujtahid, it's a very sort of informal process. Um, Basically, you are acclaimed by popular consent to be a mujtahid. Um, you go to a madrasa as a young man, maybe you're 14, 15 years old. You study at the feet of masters. You learn the hallowed texts of Islamic jurisprudence and theology. Um, at a certain stage, you might, on, you might take on students of your own. 10 years might pass, 15 years might pass. You'll gain a following. 
Um, you'll be sort of putting out religious judgments, fatawa and so forth, to guide the faithful, using your powers of intellect, referring to the Quran and so forth to make these judgments. Um, then you might write sort of an important book, and more and more people might look to you for guidance. And at that stage, um, you become a, a mujtahid. But a mujtahid who has a large following is, is, is in a, another category altogether. These are the, the marjas, the marja ataklid, the sources of, of emulation or imitation. And it's, it's to these individuals that, that people must attach themselves, you know, to gain sort of guidance and, and, and what have you. And um, these marjas um, are also given the title Grand Ayatollah. Um, again, there's the lower strata of the religious scholars, uh, students who drop out of the madrasa in the first or second phase of learning. Um, these people will become prayer leaders in villages, guardians of small mosques, rural peach preachers. And these local mullahs will, will function as intermediaries between the sources of emulation, the marja, and, and the people. They will communicate the will of the marja uh, to the population. Now, how does one become a mujtahid? Um, well, um, education at a religious seminary such as Qom. There are also important religious seminaries in places like um, Isfahan. Um, the course at a madrasa is, is composed of three levels. The mukadimat, which is the preliminary level, in which the student will learn syntax, grammar, logic, and rhetoric. Logic, you know, based on the Aristotelian syllogism, is especially important because these mujtahids have to, be learn, uh, have to be taught how to argue. They have to be taught how to use reason in discerning God's will. They have the Quran, the traditions of the Prophet Muhammad, also the Hadith or traditions of the various Imams, but they also have to sort of employ reason where these sources are silent in determining God's will. So a student who enters at this sort of preliminary level might be 15, 16, 18 years old. And once they sort of uh, master those preliminaries, they progress to the next stage of, edu uh, of education uh, called the externals. And here they learn the usul al-fiqh, the uh, principles of jurisprudence. They learn how to interpret the Quran. They learn about famous interpretations of the past. Um, they learn theology and study ethics. And um, the final stage of their education, and here they might be 45, 50 years old, the graduation classes. And here the teaching is conducted by prominent mujtahids. And here again, they sort of study jurisprudence, but at a more advanced level. Uh, the teaching method is the hypothetical example. What would you do in such a situation? How would you answer this question? And successful students earn a license, uh, which allows them to progress to a, a new class. Um, finally, just something about the political philosophy in, uh, by the way, just, you know, when it comes to that education, I remember, you know, prior to um, studying, um, you know, Islam, doing doctorate work in Islamic Middle Eastern studies, I, I was a, a I studied medieval European history. And, you know, I read the church fathers, people like Anselm and um, Aquinas and so forth. And I remember reading a, a book by um, Ayatollah Tabat Taba'i, a prominent Iranian cleric. It was a book about Shia Islam and philosophy. And it was very, very familiar to what I had read in the um, medieval scholastics of Europe. I mean, everything was there in place. The seek et non method, the via negativa, it was very, very familiar to me. It was couched in Persian and Arabic, but it was the same stuff. And the interesting thing is that it's a living tradition. Oops. Now, um, again, you know, the, the, the basic idea is that in the absence of the 12th Imam, all worldly authority is illegitimate. You know, the, the Sunni caliphs were illegitimate. Um, Sultans, presidents, kings, all illegitimate. The only legitimate ruler is the 12th Imam, and he's not here with us. So what are the Shia to do? Well, there are four possibilities. One is to adopt 
a position of political cooperation. Um, the notion here is that bad government is better than no government at all. Let us live and persist under this Sunni monarchy. Let us persist under the, this non-Islamic government. Uh, we might even cooperate with it because there is the need for a custodial authority. There is need for order on earth. The 12th Imam isn't here. If we remove this bad government, the result would be, you know, absolute chaos. So we have to sort of make do with the situation. Um, another sort of uh, attitude adopted by religious clerics, especially in Shi'i history, is to focus on religious obligations only. You know, the government is illegitimate, um, will keep aloof from it, and just focus on pietistic uh, exercises. Um, then there's the third sort of possibility, uh, and that is to try and bring these illegitimate temporal authorities in line with the Sharia. You know, function as the conscious of the nation. And I think this is the tact taken by the Ayatollah Sistani, who's, president, who's resident in Najaf. He's an Iranian by birth, but he's probably the most prominent marja taqlid, you know, in the Shi'i world today. Uh, he has many, many followers in Iran. Uh, but he doesn't believe that, um, you know, uh, clerics should uh, rule. He doesn't believe in the doctrine of Velayat the Faqih, as I'll explain in just a moment. Um, he believes that he should sort of uh, counsel the political authorities, um, but he doesn't believe that the, you know, chief jurist has uh, any right to rule. And, and the fourth doctrine is the guardianship of the jurist, the Velayat the Faqih. And uh, this is a, a philosophy um, do I have about five minutes? This is a philosophy put together by uh, the Ayatollah Khomeini. Ayatollah Khomeini, um, as you know, was exiled from Iran following the uprising of 1963. He went initially to Turkey, but eventually relocated to Iraq, where he taught at Najaf in the great seminary there. And he delivered a, a series of lectures that were collected in the late 60s, early 70s, called The Guardianship of the Jurist. And in this work, Khomeini argued that the top-ranking jurist consul to the period, the top-ranking marja, had the right not only to represent the 12th imam in his, in his religious function, as, as guide of the community, but in his political function as well. The top-ranking jurist had the right to hold executive authority. Now, whether Khomeini was kind of setting himself up in this book for an eventual leadership role is a moot point. Um, it's, it's not at all clear that he foresaw the, you know, that he would take power um, you know, uh, eight or nine years later. But this is the doctrine that really sustains the theocracy um, in the Islamic Republic of Iran. And it's a minority opinion. Outside of Iran, most Shi'i divines do not recognize the legitimacy of the guardianship of the jurist. Uh, they believe that this is a usurpation of you know, uh, an executive power that belongs rightly to the 12th Imam. But um, It justifies the whole institution of the supreme leadership um, in the Islamic Republic of, of Iran. Um, I, I think I'll just leave it there, and we can open it to conversation and questions. Thank you very much. That was uh, an incredibly encyclopedic and yet incredibly clear presentation of uh, Sunni versus Shia, and Shia all the way up to today's Iran. Do you want me to stay up here? Yes, please do. Questions? Yes. So we'll open it up for questions. We ask you to post your uh, 10 cards vertically. We'll begin with one of our speakers, Lawrence Yusik. I wonder if you might uh, comment a little bit on the difference in the perception of time and history between the Islamic conception and what we in the West, and particularly in the US, seem to see as our conception of the schedule of things and, and how we plan and operate, because it seems to be one of those things that students have a great deal of trouble grasping. Well, if I understand your question correctly, Lawrence, um, 
Well, let me sort of answer it this way. I mean, uh, I think, um, you know, history from this sort of Shi'i perspective is conceived in cosmic terms. Um, not necessarily in terms of a causal relation of, of connected events, but as a cosmic sort of ongoing struggle between good and evil. I think this is a mindset that's common to Islamism as a whole. Um, so for example, you know, in Iraq in the, you know, five or six years ago, uh, you would often see uh, pictures of a medieval Christian crusader juxtaposed to an American Marine. Um, the idea is that the crusade is in you know, perpetual motion, uh, that the West has had it in for the Islamic world since the Middle Ages. Um, faces have changed, uh, dress styles have changed, technology has changed, but the struggle remains the same and, 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 and permanent. And so uh, I think in the, you know, the, the Shi'i conception, there is this, this notion that um, the, the world is filled with illegitimacy, illegitimate you know, rulers, um, hardship and trials. Uh, the Shia present themselves as sort of a righteous remnant, this community that's been sort of hounded and persecuted, that's kind of you know, holding up the candle of, 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 of truth through, through this period of darkness. And um, that, you know, the, the, the struggle waged against the, the, the Shia by the Umayyads is really no different from the tribulations undergone by that community uh, under the Pahlavi monarch and, and, and so forth. Um, Iran continues to see you know, itself as surrounded by enemies. You know. um, I mean, you had the Americans in Iraq and Afghanistan and so forth. Um, uh, there's this idea that you know, Iran is sort of under siege I don't know if that's getting at your, your question in any way. Okay. Uh, Pat, we'll go to the right here. Uh, Patrick Whelan, St. Stephen's Episcopal School, Bradenton, Florida. Thank you. Uh, I have a question about the issue of uh, lineage and descent. To what extent does the idea of blood lineage to uh, Ali and Fatima play a role today with people who may claim that as part of their heritage? How does that enter in socially and politically? Yes, I mean, there are other descendants of the Imams, and these individual, individuals are known as Sayyids. They are part of the bloodline. Um, and um, they, they receive uh, certain sort of benefits, um, financial, for example. Um, they're figures of prestige within their local community because they do represent sort of a link back to the Prophet Muhammad. Um, now, it's, 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 it's clear to, to Muslims that many um, you know, Sayyids um, are not authentic Sayyids, you know, um, that they have sort of manufactured their genealogy to, to gain these benefits. Um, but I think that's, that's fairly rare. And I think these individuals are sort of you know, known in their local communities and their ancestry has been documented and so forth. Um, but these are individuals who aren't in the direct line of descent but who are part of the Holy Family, who sort of branch off from it. And they're they are, they are significant in, in their local communities because again, they do represent this living link with the, with the sacred past. Okay, on the left side here, um, Jeff Moore from Bandon High School in Oregon. I, I'm wondering, um, given the events in Syria um, uh, with the rebellion there and the um, Iranian in Iraq Shiite support for um, that rulership and what's going on there, given the fact um, with this emphasis on being oppressed uh, as a people, if that's causing some consternation in regards to um, that long tradition and, and if that's sort of making problems for the current regimes there. Well, well of course, the, the rulership in, in Syria is Alawi, um, which is sort of a subsect within Shiism. Um, some people will debate that it really knows, has no place within Shiism, that it's, it's unorthodox and sui generis. Um, 
I think, you know, Iran's interest in Syria is geopolitical primarily. Um, they have established this relationship with the Alawi minority in Syria in order to um, establish sort of weight against uh, Iraq and sort of other regional players. Um, of course, the, uh, the Alawi regime functions as a useful sort of conduit of, of influence into Lebanon, you know, through, through Hezbollah. So um, that the relationship has had that function as well. But as far as I know, um, the Iranian regime does not sort of, um, you know, articulate this relationship in uh, overtly religious terms. If somebody knows better, I'd, I'd, I'd be interested to know. Next question but, okay. from the right side of the room, uh, Robert uh, Boucheri, I notice this is the third teacher from Carmel High School in New York <laughs> well, State. Well represented I am, today. I, I imagine that Carmel is going to be starting a Center for Iranian <laughs> Studies next year. Thank you. Um, I was just curious about the, um, the control of the schools in Iran. And is it entirely religious or is it secular at all? Because we're talking about change before. And if, you, you know, if the schools are controlled entirely by religion, you know, is that going to be possible to change or, or not? Well, I think we have to make a distinction between the madrasas, the religious schools, and, um, and then the state school system. Um, um, you know, madrasas, of course, you know, are meant to train mujtahids, essentially, you know, create the clerical class that has such influence in the country today. Um, but then you have, you know, um, other, other schools that train students in reading, writing, arithmetic, and so forth. They'll have religious studies as part of the curriculum. And of course, you know, the, the Islamic Republic also has, you know, uh, universities um, where religious studies are taught, where technical subjects are taught, history, all manner of subjects, the same sort of variety of subjects that are taught uh, in, in an American university. Um, I don't know if Amin has anything to say about that. We're talking about the schools, the state school. Yeah. I mean, those who, those who enter the madrasas, a school like Qum, sort of have a vocation. It might be expected of them by their families. They might feel a religious calling. Um, and they will enter these establishments, again, in their teenage years. And they'll go as far as they can. Some find that they have no aptitude for it. Uh, for financial reasons, they can't continue, although funds are provided these seminary students, um, often from the marriages themselves. Um, many of these funds come from the state as well. Um, but others, you know, continue on, and uh, a select few become marriages. In any period, there might be three or four, you know, sources of emulation. And again, um, a, a Muslim has to follow the guidance, the teachings of one of these. And each marja has offices throughout the world. Um, so you might uh, have a question. Um, you're a Shi'i Muslim, and you're going to be traveling to Europe. And you're wondering how you should do your ablutions, say your prayers while you're away, uh, what's expected of you as a Muslim over the course of your trip. And you will contact your source of emulation. And um, he will you know, consult the Quran, the sources, use his own wisdom his powers of reason in, in, in discerning an answer. Um, I mean, I ask you to go, for example, to sustani.org. Uh, the Ayatollah Sistani, again, resident in Najaf, has a wonderful website. It's in English, French, Farsi, and Arabic. I think German, too. And um, there's this one question, uh, this one section of fatwas, you know, juridical opinions. And um, there, you know, this, this grand ayatollah will entertain questions from all over the world. You know, is non-alcoholic beer, you know, um, all right to drink? Um, what about masturbation? Um, you know, uh, what about, um, you know, uh, uh, I'm, I'm doing my ablutions to say my prayers, and a, and a dog just out of the water shakes himself, and I get, you know, some... You know, all the questions, you know, ritual matters, life matters, they're all sort of dealt with. 
question from uh, Rick Weiss at uh, Trenton Central High School in New Jersey. I just wonder on, the, on a daily life basis between oh. Sunnis and Shis, do they live next to each other? Would they intermarry? And well, it depends on what, you know, when and where you're talking about. Um, so, for example, in the 1950s and 1960s, this is a period that I'm particularly interested in, there was really no sectarian tension in, in most countries of the Middle East between Sunnis and Shis. Um, in fact, they regarded one another as kind of fellow travelers in this struggle against imperialism. So, for example, Egyptian Islamists of the period, you know, belonging to the Muslim Brotherhood, were very much um, influenced and... Um, well, they very much admired the Ayatollah Kashani, you know, who was struggling against sort of imperialism in Iran, you know, British influence in particular and so forth. Um, I think we have to consider, you know, the, the tensions that have developed in recent years between Sunnis and, and Shi'is as political in nature. And to some extent, they're related to this great sort of cold war that's transpiring between the Islamic Republic of Iran and Saudi Arabia. You know, each of these countries regards itself as leader of the world's Muslims. And each has surrogates, you know, throughout the world. And um, just as the United States and the Soviet Union did in the 1950s and 1960s, um, these two powers are intent on finding regional allies and uh, confronting one another geopolitically. Uh, so, for example, I, I was just reading an AP uh, news report that there are presently uh, hundreds, actually, of uh, Iraqi Shi'i Muslims making their way into uh, Syria to aid and abet the Alawi regime there, you know, fighting on behalf of, of their religion. Um, even though, as I mentioned, the Alawis are not Twelvers and there are significant differences, there, there is a belief that Syria, you know, sort of belongs in this sort of, you know, Shi'i axis um, that extends from you know, Tehran through Baghdad now uh, in, in, into Syria. Um, you know, certainly in Iraq, you know, for example, um, in a city like Baghdad, um, it was quite common for Sunnis and, and Shi'is to intermarry. Uh, there were mixed neighborhoods and so forth. Um, but then the civil war began. And this is a civil war that was aided and abetted by Al-Qaeda, you know, radical jihadis, Sunni jihadis. And their whole sort of, you know, um, plan was to, you know, attack the Shia community, to encourage a Shia backlash against the Sunnis, and in that way create a civil war. And, um, you know, you look at these maps of, of Baghdad from like 19, you know, or from like 2000 until like, let's say 2009, and you see how the Shi'i and, and Sunni communities in Baghdad, you know, gradually sort of self-segregate. You know, you see all these mixed neighborhoods in the, in, in, in the center of the city. And, you know, the, 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 the situation of conflict takes place. And you, know, the, the, you have all these, you know, bands of solid color eventually uh, in the city. But that's political. I, you know, I mean, um, the Salafi Muslims amongst the Sunnis have always been vociferously anti-Shia. So I had a, a student who came from a Shia family in Pakistan, and he made the point that... Um, his grandfather would sort of inscribe the names of um, uh, Abu Bakr, um, Umar, and Uthman on the soles of his shoes. These are the first three of the Rashidun caliphs. Just, just <laughs> for no political reason, just because. You know. We have time uh, for one more question. And if there are no objections, I'd like to use that opportunity to ask a question. In uh, the early 1980s, you used the term fatwa, a religious fatwa. edict. Yeah. Uh, in the early 1980s, uh, the Ayatollah Khomeini issued a fatwa uh, ordering the killing of the British Indian novelist Salman Rushdie for his book, Satanic Verses. Uh, I'm wondering, what was the religious status of that fatwa then, and what is it today? We know um, Americans first heard the term fatwa within the context of that issuance, and, and it, it came to mean something like death sentence for most of us, or he cast a fatwa on me, a death sentence. Fatwa means juridical opinion, and it's an institution common to both Sunni and Shi'i Muslims. Again, a Muslim will come to a religious divine, whether uh, a Sunni alim or a Shi'i mujtahid, with a question on ritual obligations, on political posture, on anything that might 
you know, transpire in life. And that scholar will then go to the sources and come to an opinion. He will issue a juridical opinion, a fatwa. And the idea in Islam, and again, this is common to both Sunnis and Shi'is, is that we peer through a glass darkly. God has his way for us. And we strive through ijtihad, through personal effort, to learn what that way is. What does God want of us? We have clues. We have the Quran, the examples of the prophets for the Shia, the Imams, and so forth. God has given us wisdom to try and figure these questions out. But we, we try our best. And, and so Muslims have sort of agreed to differ. You know, this is my opinion. You know, it might differ from yours a little bit. But Muslims basically agree to differ um, on issues. So, one fatwa might be different from, from another. Um, I will say that um, you know, uh, this fatwa issued by Ayatollah Khomeini against Salman Rushdie for the writing of the Satanic Verses was obviously politically motivated. Um, Khomeini you know, wanted to sort of you know, gain support throughout the Islamic world uh, for his regime. Um, and he saw this as a way of, of doing so. Uh, he was, you know, shouting fire, you know, in a, in a, in a crowded theater, essentially. Um, that said, I, I think most uh, religious scholars, both in the Sunni and Shia worlds, uh, regarded this fatwa as, um, as specious, as, as, as not entirely legitimate. Um, that there was no cause for this man's death. We might sort of decry what he has done, but it, it was a... Min it, and again, you know, there's, there's this allowance for difference. And, and most disagreed with, with Khomeini. Okay, well, thank you very much, John. That was excellent. Thanks, yeah. Well, that was a really superb presentation. I, I know there were a lot more questions. John is uh, hanging around, so you're welcome to uh, visit him. Uh, we'll take a 15-minute break, and we'll be back at 2.15.